the North after the war and the slaughter of the Gladden Fields, the men of Westerness were diminished, and their city of Anuminas beside Lake Evendim fell into ruin, and the heirs of Valendil removed and dwelt at Fornost on the high North Downs, and that now too is desolate. Men call it Dead Men's Dyke, and they fear to tread there, for the folk of Arnor dwindled, and their foes devoured them, and their lordship passed, leaving only green mounds in the grassy hills. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today I bring you an updated video on the history of Arnor, the North Kingdom of the Dúnedain. Recently I've been speaking a lot about Elendil and his sons and their kingdoms, so I figured it was time to revisit this topic about one of my favorite kingdoms in the entire Legendarium. For more helpful and related information, please check out the articles and videos in the description and cards. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me today. Please relax and enjoy this tale about the history of Arnor. Arnor, likely meaning Land of the King in Sindarin, was first founded in 3320 of the Second Age, after Elendil's four ships from Numenor came into the lands of northern Middle-earth. While the sister kingdom of Arnor, Gondor, was founded by Elendil's sons in the south, Arnor was to be the realm more directly ruled by High King Elendil, who had the high rule of both kingdoms of the men of the west. Now as we continue to look at Arnor's history, I want to point out a theme in Tolkien's works to keep in mind. Tolkien's works produce nostalgia in many ways, nostalgia of lands and peoples of high virtue and heraldry, and they fade over time, until only the echoes of such places and peoples remain, and even then the echoes begin to fade, until all there is is memory by those learned and wise. In Arnor, perhaps more even than in Gondor, since Gondor survived to become a more modern kingdom, was kept the virtue of Numenor. And since Arnor would fall, perhaps there were more echoes of Westerness and days of men gone by to be found in the North Kingdom than in the South one. And since Gondor survived, that eventually became the last remnant of bygone Numenor at the end of the Third Age. We definitely see that in the loss of the High Kingship of both kingdoms after the death of Isildur, and that Elendil, who spent more time in Numenor than his sons, and his kingdom would fade faster, adding to that nostalgia of High Kingdoms that once were, and glorious and virtuous men that once ruled them. It is a rather compelling theme in Tolkien's works, so keep that in mind as we move forward with the history here. Continuing forth, the realm of Arnor spanned from the River Loon in the west, to the River Brunine in the east, and from the Great Sea to the Etenmors in the north. Some major places within Arnor were Anuminas, the original capital near Lake Ninuiel of Evendim, Fornost Arain, a great city and the future capital, Amonsul, later called Weathertop, a watchtower in the approximate center of the kingdom, Tharbad, an old city and ford of Numenor on the river Gwathlo, or Greyflood. Lond Dyer, or Vinyalande, an old Numenorian port. The White Towers, and one that was named Elostirion. And Bree, a town near the Great East Road running from Linden to Rivendell, and the North-South Road that ran from Fornost to Pelargir in the far south. Another spot of importance would be the Barrow Downs, where were buried the revered remains of the Adain, the ancestors of the Dunedain. So Elendil was the first ruler of Arnor, and the High King, and his seat was in Anuminas. He would place three of the Palantiri at different strongholds in Arnor, one of the lesser ones most often used by the kings in Anuminas, a large one most often used to communicate with the Asgiliath stone in Amonsul, and one in Elostirion that could not communicate with the other stones of Middle-earth, but was rather used by Elendil to look west to Tol Erisea, where the master stone of the Palantiri was. At the founding of Arnor, there were yet many faithful Dúnedain left in the kingdom, enough to continue to populate and even mix with the men of Middle-earth. But even in Arnor's seclusion in the peaceful north, being near to friends and allies in the elves and dwarves, they were not impervious to harm. First was the War of the Last Alliance that would call away many Dúnedain to battle, and many, including High King Elendil himself, would not return to the North Kingdom, but it would persevere through the line of kings through Isildur. Now Isildur, son of Elendil and last High King of both Arnor and Gondor until Aragorn II, would also not return to his son Valendil in the north, falling to orcs at the beginning of the Third Age. And so Arnor was already left weakened and sorrowful in its infancy, at the loss of its founder and leader, and his successor as well. But all was not lost. Valendil, the last surviving son of Isildur, would take up the kingship of Arnor and the scepter of Anuminas, but he would not lay claim to the kingship of Gondor, where his cousin Meneldil ruled. And though Valendil and his line would still retain the title High King of Arnor, it was just that, Arnor. 
And so it was that Arnor continued forth into the early centuries of the Third Age, but it never fully recovered from the loss of its first High King, or many of its people from the Last Alliance, and the people diminished. Eventually, in 861 of the Third Age, after the death of the Tenth King of Arnor, Air Render, the Kingdom of Arnor split through civil war into three petty kingdoms, for Air Render had three sons, and each desired power. One son founded the petty kingdom of Rudaur in the east, another began Cardolin in the south, whose capital was the Barrowdowns, and Amleith, the eldest son and true heir of Eärendil, founded Arthedain in the northwest. Amleith's name was not in the high tongue of Quenya, rather it was in Sindarin instead, and this tradition of taking Sindarin names would continue on in his line. Anuminas was abandoned, the streets of Elendil city laid empty, and the people and kings removed to Fornost in the North Downs, and the Anuminas stone was brought thither as well. While the infighting and civil war between these three brothers and sons of Eärendil likely began in rivalry and jealousy, it continued forth into these petty kingdoms, who mostly conflicted over the control of the Weather Hills and, most importantly, Amonsul and its great Palantir, for Arthedain had mastery of the other two. It's sad that this once great kingdom of Elendil the Tall had fallen so low to petty squabbles and infighting. Thus the three petty kingdoms of Arnor were already weakened, and a true enemy of the West, he who became known as the Witch King of Angmar, saw his chance to strike. Sometime during the reign of Malvagil, the sixth king of Arthedain, around 1300 of the Third Age, the realm of Angmar to the north began its rise under the Witch King. Now the line of Isildur had failed in Rudaur and Cardolan, and the son of Malvagil, Argaleb I, desired to remake a unified Arnor, and he claimed kingship over all the petty kingdoms. But Rudaur resisted this, for it had been overtaken by a lord of Hillmen who had a secret alliance with Angmar. In 1356, Argaleb made a strong fortified line along the Weather Hills against Rudaur, but he was slain. His son, King Arvaleg I, retaliated with aid from Cardolin and the Elves of Linden, and drove Rudaur and Angmar back. But they would not remain in defeat, and in 1409, at the true start of the Angmar War, Angmar crossed the Horwell River, and crushed the Arthedainian and Cardolinian defense of Amonsul, and the Watchtower was destroyed, becoming Weathertop, more like how it would be known in The Lord of the Rings. But its Palantir was saved and taken to Fornost, where the Anumina Stone also was. The King Arvaleg and the last Prince of Cardolin were slain. The true Dúnedain of Rudaur were pushed west. The faithful men of Cardolin held out in the Barrow Downs or in the Old Forest, and the men of Arthedain, with aid from Círdan and leadership of the new young King Erefor, pushed back the enemy from Fornost and the North Downs. It is said that Angmar became subdued for a time by elves from Linden and Rivendell, and Elrond had brought aid from over the mountains from Lorien. Now, throughout these centuries of the mid-Third Age, hobbits had come over from the mountains into places throughout Arnor, and many eventually settled in the Shire, which had once been the hunting grounds of the kings of Arnor, and they considered themselves to be subjects of the king. Most hobbits had moved to the Shire by 1601 of the Third Age. Though the remnants of Arnor had time to breathe, the sorrows of the North were not yet through. In 1636, the Great Plague hit the North, greatly devastating the peoples of Eriador except for Arthedain, which was hardly touched. But Cardolin was effectively ruined, for the Witch King had at some point, during his battles with them, also sent Barrow Whites to haunt the mounds in Cardolin's capital of Tirn Gorthad, the Barrow Downs. Arthedain was really the only part of the kingdom that yet stood, but it would not remain, for Malbeth the Seer, a man with great foresight and an advisor to the King Arifant, advised the king to name his son Arvidui, meaning Last King where he would be the last in Arthedain. He foretold that a great choice would come to the Dúnedain, and if they took the path that seemed less hopeful, Arvidui would change his name and become king of a great realm. And if not, much sorrow and the lives of many men would pass until the men of the West arose and were united once more. This Malbeth would also later foresee Aragorn's passage through the paths of the dead. Indeed, his vision of Arvidui was correct, for during the last king's life, he would marry Firiel, a descendant of Anarion, the brother of Isildur, the ancestor of Arvidui. And when Gondor was without a king, Arvidui attempted to claim the high kingship of both Arnor and Gondor, for he was descended from Isildur. But Gondor would reject this, naming a true descendant of Anarion, Aernil II, as king. And so it would be that Arvidui's descendants, all the way to Aragorn II and beyond, were descended from both Isildur and Anarion, 
this would not save Arvidwi. And so he was the last king of Arthedain, as Angmar returned in 1974 and took Fornost. The Witch King had forced out King Arvidwi and his sons, and the rest of his people, and Arvidwi and a few men went to the dwarf mines of the far end of the Blue Mountains in the north, and then Forokel, far in the north, with the Palantiri, seeking aid from the people there, the Losoth. Such aid they gave indeed, and eventually Aranarth told Círdan the shipwright of his father's flight to the north, and so Círdan sent a ship to find Arvidwi. Eventually the elven ship got there, and though the Losoth were afraid, Arvidwi boarded the ship, not heeding their warning, but giving to them instead the Ring of Barahir for them to ransom some wealth from his men, in payment for what the Losoth did for the king. Arvidwi, and the Anumina Stone, and the Amonsul Stone thus drowned on the ship, for a great storm had come, and thus the last king was no more. His son Aranarth became the first chieftain of the Dúnedain, as Arthedain was in ruins. Though they had called upon Gondor for aid, it was too late. The Battle of Fornost took place in 1975, during which the armies of Gondor, the elves, and even some hobbits fought against and ousted Angmar from the north. But the remaining Dúnedain of the north were so few that they became rangers, or perhaps villagers, in the scattered settlements of the Dúnedain. The chieftains after Aranarth were raised for a time under Elrond and Rivendell, beginning a tradition, and just as the Ring of Barahir, Shards of Narsil, Scepter of Anuminas, and Second Star of Elendil survived on, the line of kings endured. And so it was that the Dúnedain rangers, led by their chieftain Aragorn II, after many years and many different chieftains, took part in fighting against Sauron, the master of the Witch King, who had brought their kingdom low, during the War of the Ring near the end of the Third Age, and evil would be defeated. Thus, in 3019 of the Third Age, Aragorn did what his ancestors could not and reunited not only Arnor, but the realms of Numenor in exile, becoming the High King of both Arnor and Gondor, the reunited kingdom. Men would once again live in their northern kingdom, and Anuminas, the seat of Aragorn in the north, would be remade. The artifacts of the kings were all taken up once more by King Elisar. The Shire would be a protected land in Arnor, and surely other lands and settlements would be rebuilt and protected by the new people of the kingdom, who no longer had to hide in the wilds as rangers, but could repair, heal, and remember what came before. And so, as a new Arnor survived forth into time, we come to the end of our tale. From the story of Arnor, we see that nothing is ever truly lost. It is important to remember who we are and what we stand for, for no darkness can take that from us. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed today's video on Arnor. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this video with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections on the history of Arnor? Let me know in the comments below. For me, Arnor has always been nostalgic, especially because of its portrayal in The Lord of the Rings Online. And if I were to live somewhere in Middle-earth, especially after the events of The Lord of the Rings, I would highly consider living near the Lake Nanuiel and Numenas. I want to shout out our Valar tier patrons, Adrian de la Tour, Chris Ordner, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putnam, Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, Tobias Goldner, Ryan Ramsey, Merton, John Hume, Tom Bombadil, Ridgey93, Jennifer Woods, Sam McBee, Matt Sabach, Quantum Catalyst, Elizabeth Calvert, and Matt Gibbs, and Ben Gardner, our newest Valar tier patrons. And thank you to all of my patrons, it really means a lot. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today, and I'll see you all again next week with a video on the peoples of Middle-earth after the Lord of the Rings. Everyone, thank you all so much for joining me in this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.